everyone. This is Cheryl and Daryl Duick here with Gospel Music Industry Hub or GMI Hub Studio Talk. And today we are talking about mixing and, and mastering. mastering. It's actually more on mastering. So before we get into this, why doesn't everybody just get into the chat on Facebook and just tell us what you thought is of mastering. What is mastering? Or what's the art of mastering or the little pixie dust or whatever else you think mastering does to make your track sound better. Why don't you do that? And while you're doing that, uh, Cheryl's going to introduce you who our guest is for tonight. We are honored today to have Larry Anthony all the way from Oklahoma. He is a mastering engineer who's been in the business for 52 years, but only in the last, well, since 1999, has been actually focusing on mastering. He has uh, degrees in electronics and acoustics, um, and as well as psych psychoacoustics to provide the best possible sound in mastering. He has worked with such artists as... Zach Brown, CeeLo Green, and C3 Worship. Those are just some of the big name artists that he's worked with. I think he has a little bit of experience and background behind him. So um, welcome here, Anth uh, Larry. Great, great to be here. Yeah, so I'm just gonna ask you, what is mastering? What is mastering? Well, it's a big voodoo thing. But <laughs> no. Uh, behind the curtains. Don't yeah, look behind yeah, the yeah, curtains. Yeah. Don't don't pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Yeah. Uh, it pr primarily what mastering is going to do is is it just reveal the mix uh, and the reality that's in that mix and set it up where that it it will play back uh, consistently across a wide variety of media, uh, primarily is streaming, you know, the, uh, in today's market, it's 80, 85% 80, of deliveries via some streaming service. So we have to uh, make sure we're not getting stepped on by those because they like to, to uh, turn things down that are too loud and, and, uh, and, and some of them, about half of them turn stuff up that's not loud enough. Either way, if you stay start messing with your file, it's usually not going to come out uh, as rosy as you would think. So what you're saying so, is now that Spotify has created their own mastering log, uh, algorithm, that's not a mm -hmm. good algorithm to use for mastering then? Well, it's very automated in the sense it's not really listening to your music it's looking at the uh analytically looking at it for its levels and and maybe some frequency analyzation goes so there's not a person listening to it from a musical aspect at least to my knowledge there's not um whereas where you have a mastering engineer that's that's listening to it for its ability to, to have good focus uh, good depth and detail uh, that that's just that takes on a whole different aspect of mastering because now now you've got a personal aspect a human aspect to it where the with the just the algorithms on Spotify and YouTube and Pandora and others it's just a strictly a mechanical math approach the way I understand it right so why would they send it away? Like, because it keeps going, they can master their own versus yep. sending away to somebody else to mastering, or they can have their buddy yep. come in mastering. Why would they send it to you versus them doing it there well, in their house? Well, <laughs> most of the time, the, the people that are doing uh, mastering at home in their basement, in the garage, in the bedroom, they're using quote unquote, mastering plugs that do this and do that and do the other. And these things pretty much all have presets and because there's not a, a maybe a lot of uh, experience with mastering and, and specializing in that, the presets are pretty convenient to just pull one up and, and hope for the best. And, you know, I mean, the thing about it is it comes out different, so you're psychologically you feel like it's better and it comes out louder and that's you know something's louder com uh, compared to something that's not quite as loud 
human nature is just going to pick the louder one, whether it sounds better or not. It's just an automatic response. And uh, good mastering is going to increase uh, the connectivity, if you will, of your music, because it lifts the reality level. Uh, depending on how good that mix is, how much detail and, uh, and low level content that there is built into the mix, that's fidelity. I mean, fidelity allows you to have uh, uh, contain or, or retain the low volume information that surrounds everything, that's, every sound that's in that mix. If we start, we start losing that low volume detail uh, by way of just not recording it or having too much process noise covering it up, then we just sound less and less real and more and more artificial. And it just, you know, at the end of the day for the listeners, it just doesn't connect as well. It's just not carrying that level of reality. We like it to be real. So let's go back to, you said low content volume? Yeah. When you're saying that, just tell them a little bit, when you're saying that, is it just somebody playing really quietly on the keyboard or somebody yeah. singing versus no, loud? Something, something as loud as, loud as I mean, we'd like to use, for a good analogy, we'd like to use a snare drum. You no, know, a big loud whack on the snare drum. As loud as that is, uh, it has low volume content from the decay and the, the sound of that drum decaying and, and fading away all the way down to where you just can't hear it anymore. Right now, that low volume detail around that thing is what allows it to sound like the snare drum that it is. Say we take and, and reduce our the depth, the bit depth of our recording from 24 bit to 16 bit, then we've just removed about 45 dB of dynamic range, that lower volume of information is now not there. We're kind of robbing ourselves that detail. Detail is something that we can, in mastering, we can pull up or reveal to where that, that, that drum sounds, sounds uh, more not recorded and more unprocessed, just more natural. Uh, if we start losing that, that detail uh, through uh, means of compression, uh, severe limiting, other processes that's going to tend to apply noise, and every process has degradation to it, everything you do. So the more we do to it, <laughs> trying to make it sound better, usually the worse we end up many times. And, and then what happens is with that snare drum, as we begin to lose a low volume detail, that thing sounds, that thing will sound less like a snare drum and become more like a cardboard box sound. You just start losing the characteristics and the natural sound of that, that thing by changing it. Now, there's, there's, um, there's aspects of over, processing that's used a lot with electric guitars say and things like that that effectively produces that sound on purpose and it's not to say that the over processing is not is always bad it's sometimes intentional and good so uh but even with those processes the higher end process still preserve the low volume detail many times of that instrument itself you know instead of the difference between using a, a, a $200 piece of outboard gear versus a $20,000 piece of outboard gear, that price tag is going to show at the end of the day and how, what that thing sounds like. Um, it's not always about the dollar, but so many times in this business, it does tend, the price tag does tend to show up. It's <laughs> Don't sweat the small stuff, but it's all in the details. And I guess that $20,000 yeah. piece of equipment is the details. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, you know, uh, the U2 guitar player, uh, Ed, they go, he goes by Edge, right? That's what he calls himself. And that's what we call him. And I know that he, it, the effects pieces that he runs his guitar through, uh, he'll have that whole rack and those things just run, they thing run directly through those 
those devices and most all of those are you know ten fifteen twenty thousand dollar pieces every one of them and uh and he can, can use anything he wants obviously Man. Um, but uh he's he's chosen and he has some of the greatest sounding distorted guitars if you will and overdriven guitars of anybody i've ever heard okay. anybody's heard very much <laughs> you two know, you know you, you know that right so. right Larry, we have some questions from the audience that are already popping in. So is it okay if I ask you a few of them? Because it's ask really me a question. <laughs> ask me a question. Okay. Um, one question, uh, the first question that came out was, um, why do I need my mixes mastered? This is from a singer songwriter that I guess is just in mm -hmm. the recording stage. And right. I want to know why. Yeah. Why do I need my mixes well, mastered? The reason why you want to master this, if you're going to put them out, and you want to compete in the marketplace, then you, again, it's kind of like what we've just been talking about. You want it to sound as real and natural as possible and as less processed as you can get by with because of music. At the end of the day, we're music lovers by, by creation. We just love music. And, and uh, so the reason why you'd want it mastered is so that we can, we can we can pull that detail, we can pull that musicality, if you will, to the surface and, that rea and lift the reality level so that, so that people, they hear your song and they want, they connect with it well and they want, they want to hear it again and again and again. The more they listen to your music, the more others around them are going to hear it. So, you know, it kind of um, starts a domino effect. If it's, if it's mastered well, if it's not mastered, uh, it, it's, you know, it's just, it's just not going to compete very well out there sometimes. Just depending, you know, on, on the media you go to, but if you go out there, uh, again, with the streamers, the Spotify, the YouTubes, the Pandoras, the iTunes, uh, Amazon music, those guys, you know, they're, they're going to tend to manipulate your music in one way or the other and if we're not set up to where we're in their wheelhouse so to speak when your music hits them so they're not messing with it because it'll change it and it's usually not for the best but but the problem with that though is with what you're saying though is if you have a master one master done spotify has something different than itunes uh -huh. versus pandora versus uh -huh. youtube do you right. change that for every single platform no. you send it to than, than no, radio? There's, no, there's no, because they're not that far. They're not that far apart. You just not. You need to get in the ballpark. Usually, you choose one or another. Most of us in this business tend to lean towards you, uh, YouTube uh, for uh, a guideline based on what they're going to do. I mean, Spotify does a little different, and it will be somewhat. I've noticed it's more frequency driven with Spotify uh, in one direction. And if, it, if it's more heavy in the bottom end or, or, or something different EQ wise, then one of the others may reduce a little bit more. We're talking about volume reduction too versus uh, them, you know, doing what's called auto gain and pulling your stuff your your volume up they'll and they'll do that too some of them will not all of them youtube i don't think will increase volume but they will turn it down or spotify will, will actually pull it up I believe itunes will as well there's a couple of them two or three of them actually will pull the volume up if it's too low which could be helpful but at the same time you're probably going to hit the limiters which isn't going to be helpful <laughs> typically so, so what, I mean, that's a very touchy thing. Lim <laughs> limiting and mastering is like, you got to be able to do it, but you got to be able to do it without being there, without telling that it's there. Okay. Right? It's got to be transparent. So what are some of the, the benchmarks if somebody who's doing it from their home studio, because for some reason they can't send it to a mastering house, what right. should they be aiming for? What should they not be doing? to be able to send well, it out and make I it would, I would suggest, I mean, there's some free services out there and you can go to uh, 
meter plugs, loudness penalty dot com. They have they just have they have a little um, uh, utility that you can just upload, attach your file to it. It doesn't actually upload to them. It just analyzes it over the internet, and then it will show you how what kind of loudness penalty you're going to get from each one of those uh, streaming services. And it's a free thing. I mean, it doesn't cost unless you want to want their plug in then you pay for that. But the service that they have online on the website so you, is free. So you can go have them analyze it and then you can go in and you can do that from home. Yeah. From your and then computer. Squish and, then, and then do it yourself with their suggestion. You can, well, yeah, you, you want to, you want to hit a range where you're not getting turned down a whole lot. Right. But you want, you want to be up in there like with YouTube, a lot of, a lot of us will tell you, you know, shoot for something like a loudness penalty of a minus 1.5. It's like YouTube's going to turn your file down by 1.5 dB. So that's telling me they're, they're just going to simply turn it down. They're not going to really change anything. They're just going to keep you from going above a certain volume because of the loudness. It, it still all stems from a uh, uh, COM Act that was passed years ago by the FCC, I think, in this country that, that governs cable TV and cable transmissions like that. And it's kind of been adopted by the industry and in the BBC in, in England and those people have adopted all that as kind of a, a, a stop gap for all the complaints they get. Yeah, I mean, you've listened to, been listening to uh, something on TV or radio and then a commercial comes on and it just rips the top of your head off because it's so stinking loud, you know? And that's, there's been a lot of complaints over the years recently, uh, that kind of thing. So that's, that's why these, these services start to do that, trying to avoid all the, uh, all the getting fussed at. <laughs> so, so does that answer all your questions? Oh, do I need, to make, up, do I need to make up something else? <laughs> oh, there's more. There's more questions. Well, you answered one question, another question without me asking, which is how much should one pay for mastering a song? And it sounds like it ranges from zero if it's uh, using an online service to whatever the plugin costs, or yeah. is there another charge? Well, now that online service I was mentioning doesn't do any mastering. It's just a meter. It's oh. just showing you where you're at. Yeah. Okay. Just, just be clear on that. Go back to the meter plugs to the loudness penalty meter. That's just telling you where you're at. You still got to go back and make the changes and then test it again. It's just a testing device, not a mastering device. Uh, what was the rest of that question? So how much should one be paying to master a uh, song? Well, the average, it, it varies widely. I mean, there, there's guys out there that's mastering songs for $25 a song online, right? And then you got guys, you know, I'm not even going to mention their name because I'm the real top end, but they won't even talk to you for under 5,000 or something. You, you won't even get in the door. And we're talking about like the, the Bob Ludwigs and those kind of guys that are just like excellent at what they do. And, and uh, there's a number of them out there that are just really, really good. And their discography, you know, allows them those kind of rates, that kind of, because the average, I can tell you what I've been told the national average is, and that's right where we sit on our on our uh, mastering is two fifty per song. Two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty per, per song. song. Yeah, yeah. Now there may be some if you got a, doing a whole album and you got multiple songs, uh, you know there'll likely be some discounts in there. Just depending, we just do a project pricing here. Right. So it just depends. It's negotiated. Uh, if you've got alternate versions, if you've got radio edits, uh, performance tracks, um, uh, instrumentals, uh, some people even do acapellas. If you're gonna, if if you're gonna go out there and your your piece of music is gonna be used in advertising in any way, then you need both instrumental and acapella both, because they're gonna. They're going to want music with words for a little bit, and they're going to run them talk over it, so they don't want any lyrics or any 
any singing vocals in there. So, you know, you have all that. Those alternate tracks, if they're done along with the main track, are just like, we add $25 for each one of them. We just run them through the same process. So it's like, it's almost a no brainer. Right. You would want to just go ahead and get those done and have them. It's better to have it, not need it, than need it, not have it. You come back later, then it's, you know, it's a 50% of whatever the original was to pull all that session back up. Uh, I mean, it's, we're, we're not, because we're not strictly digital, we have analog gear involved in this as well. It's, it's not an instant recall. If you come back a month later and want your alternate tracks done, then there's a lot more time involved. If there's more time involved, then it's more money, right? <laughs> of course. I just yeah. want to welcome all the viewers that are joining us right now. We are on GMI Hub Studio Talk, and we're talking about mastering, and we are so glad that we have Anthony, sorry, Larry Anthony, all the way from Oklahoma, <laughs> who is a mastering engineer, um, a specialist in mastering, and he is sharing his wisdom with us. Hey, listen, this is not a private conversation, so go ahead and share this because there are people that are going to want to know this information. You need to know if you are a singer songwriter recording a song, you're going to want to know this information so that you go in with some knowledge. So that being said, more questions for Larry from the audience. <laughs> right. um, you just talked about digital and analog mastering, which is mm -hmm. better or, or both do both have a, a well, they both mastering. They both have strong points, right? There's things you can do the accuracy, of, especially with, with editing and, and the thing manipulations that you can do with digital uh, that you can't do with analog, where the where the analog has a warmth and a musical uh, uh, attitude, if you will, about it that uh, is real hard to duplicate in the digital realm. Uh, the system that we use at CUS Mastering is a is a hybrid system. So it starts out digital, everything. I mean, the files are all digital nowadays, but very seldom get anything analog anymore. It's very rare. In fact, I haven't seen anything analog come in in many months. Uh, so it's going to go into, load into computer and it, and it will come out of the computer through converters and then through some analog pieces, outboard pieces, EQ compressors, and then, and then it's uh, recaptured by the computer for further to finish up with. It's usually at that point, it's, you know, it's assembly and delivery and then, you know, encoding and that kind of thing. So um, that's, that's what the analog gets at. It's, it's like it's the best of both worlds. So it's a high, we call it a hybrid system. And uh, it just, we just feel like it's the best way to approach that. Because we're going to get some benefits out of the analog gear, especially with the tube. We have some tube equipment out there that's just lends some some really nice, warm, euphoric, if you will, character and air around things that just, you know, it's just nice. It just makes it sound nice. So, and you, it's real hard. I know digital's got all the modelers, and they're all really great if you don't compare them to the real deal. So when you do that, you're going to say, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I can buy the plug-in again for $200 or $50 or whatever. And that real, that piece of analog gear is going to cost me $7,000 or whatever it is, you know, and it's like, okay. Yeah. There's, there's a difference. <laughs> again, it's back to that price tag thing. <laughs> and digital here, here's the thing that we say a lot in, in, I'm not the only one I've heard say this, but digital wants to sound like analog when it grows up. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's come a long, long ways. I mean, I was first in the studio back in the 60s and it was pretty much all tape. I mean, the first studio I was in was a 16 track, two inch analog reel to reel. That's how they recorded. And uh, it sounded great. It's still probably one of the best sounding formats recording formats you'll ever record on to this day but um it's, it's just yeah it, it's one of those things that just almost makes you skin crawl in a good way when you hear it played back off that kind of thing so 
but um, digital's still not there. I don't think it's gotten very good. I mean, we're so used to it, and obviously, if we listen to so many MP3s and those kind of things, and it's like, you know, so <laughs> the music is so degraded and so much loss by the time it gets to that. that uh, hard to appreciate that that kind of recording in today's market mm -hmm. so, so only I, only the only the big budget record labels and stuff like that will even think about doing analog recordings so here's a big question okay there are um there are people that are doing their own recordings uh, mm -hmm. some of them are going to studios and I want to hear your impression on this. Some people who are strong on the mixing, they also say they can do mastering. Is that? Um... <laughs> that, yeah, that's what we call, we'll say it like this. If, if the same engineer, if you mix, if he mixes, if he does mix and master, that's the recipe for disaster. <laughs> and there's a good reason behind this. It's not trying to be critical I'm trying to be revealing of some facts here. The fact is, once you have mixed a project, mixed a song, you have dealt with all these individual tracks and pieces and parts, and I did this on this track, and I had to do this kind of process on that track, and all that stuff. I mean, uh, it's all things you have to do to create this piece of music. Now, when you start listening back to it, as from a mastering aspect, you need to be able to listen to it so it's just one entity, one image, one musical image. And because I've had this mix hat on, dealing with all the individual pieces and parts, no matter how hard I try, that those pieces and parts are going to reappear in my in my focus, in my thought pattern which is just going to shipwreck anything you're trying to do in mastering. In other words, that mix hat will never come off. So I, I, I've done it and you can talk to almost anybody, any pro in this business, professional mix engineer or professional mastering engineer, and they'll all agree. I haven't heard one that didn't. Uh, there's a lot of guys out there that claim to do mixing and mastering. And you know, they, they go through the process and they get it done. Um, there's a lot of reasons why they're doing that. But uh, I probably don't want to go down that rabbit trail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll ask this. We'll start backwards. Um, usually when somebody goes to write a song, they mm -hmm. go find a, well, they, they'll get their scratch or whatever else, the chords and their lyrics down. They'll go to a producer, then they'll go to the studio. Where yeah. should you come into the play on this? Do you <clears> like <throat> to be brought in fairly early on to go, hey, we've got a track to master. What should we do? What <clears> should we not do to send it to you before we send it to you? Yeah. Or, uh, or do you just want them to say, hey, here's my track, mix it? Or not mix it, master it. It, 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 uh, it goes both ways, obviously. I mean, some of the better projects we've done, there's been early collaboration on uh, because they've already picked their production team. And, and, and so they know they have their, their tracking and maybe their mixing engineer and, and their musicians that they're going to use in the studio, um, uh, the mastering engineer that they're going to use. And, you know, the, the, the great thing about collaboration up front is that you get everybody on the same page right off the bat. And, uh, and as a team, I mean, that's where you're going to get the absolute best out of your product, uh, out of your production, is, is out of that teamwork, that everybody's working so that they're providing the next person down down the pike here who is going to get this uh, – this product project next for processing and it's going to be what they need so we can get the best end product. When we, at the end of the day, we want the music to be the winner. It's one of the things that we, that we believe in is that uh, that music needs to be 
that's the priority. Mm -hmm. So what are they, so what would a mix engineer send it? How would he send you the files? What type of files are you looking for? Well, whatever the, one of the things we'll talk about up front in the collaboration is what resolution that maybe the mix engineer is going to use. And he needs to maintain that resolution. If he's going to record, say, one of the most popular thing a lot of people are doing right now is to do 48K sample rate, 24-bit word bit in a WAV file. Most of them WAV files. Some are using AIFS. Effectively, that's exactly the same thing. It's one's an Apple file, one's a Windows file, but the music data is exactly the same in both of them. It doesn't really matter which one you're using. Uh, but that lower red, that whatever that whatever that studio resolution is, we want them to maintain that throughout. When they when they take their mixes, and the common term is bounce the mix to disc. That's a a Pro Tools term that's been used for many years. Most everybody knows what that means. Uh, <clears throat> you want that, you don't want anything happening to that thing while it's being bounced. But you've got the mix that you want and any processes or conversions that you have going on in that bounce, it's going to change that mix. It's probably going to end up in, in being some loss music musically some loss in it uh there's i've run on this quite often just run on to it again recently with a really great sounding project that was still in the works so we caught it in time but he's got you know he's recording at 96k sample rate which is great there's a lot of benefit in that and 24-bit word depth well he brought in files to review because we do a kind of what we call a free review of the mixes before we master make sure we're everything we don't need to go back to the mix room and do some tweaks or some adjustments and what he brought in was 44 1 16 bit files because he thought well that's what that's what we're going to end up end up at going to the streamers that's what they ask for if we go to cd that's what goes on with cd and that is all true. However, we because of what earlier conversation about low level detail and the, and the, the deeper word depth, and then the whole uh, uh, sample rate frequency, the 96K or the 48K has a whole nother uh, aspect about it that we want to maintain as best we can as well. So we want, the, anyway, we want them to, we want those high res files unaltered. Once you have your mix delivered to the master, let the, all the mass, all your, all your production work be it done at the highest possible resolution, whatever it started out, maintain that all the way through. And then let your mastering engineer, once he is done or she is done to, to convert uh, sample rate convert and, and word depth, change your, dither your word, word depth to whatever appropriate media is that they're going to deliver in. So we'll typically deliver on whatever that high res file is, we'll deliver a, a set of uh, the same files in uh, as 44116 bit, and then we'll usually have a 320 kV MP3 set in there as well, which are usually mostly used for radio stations nowadays. So, uh, cause streamers are going to ask you usually for 44, one sixteen bit. Okay. And, uh, so anyway, long story short, that the mix engineers wants that high res file because he's going to do all his work at high resolution. And that's going to yield the best for you. Cause every process you, you go through like that, there's a loss. So let's don't go to mastering with a loss, if that's, that's the step that's gonna really kind of uh, etch in stern, stone, if you will, the, the low level detail and what this thing's gonna feel like and sound like and, and how the focus of it is gonna come across. Okay, so now because we're talking about the, the mix engineer going to the mastering, what would, um, 
how much of the mix mix uh, final project that you get do you fix? So if they send you a project or their files or their songs, how much of that would you fix? Fix? Well, the, <laughs> that's a bit of a, it's one of those things maybe that, that's misunderstood about what mastering is, is what it is not. It is not a mix fixing process. It is a mix revealing process. So if we have issues in the mix, the mastering's going to reveal those even more so. Now, there's, there's certain little things, you know, pops and clicks and things like that, that, that we can remove six, very successfully in mastering. Uh, but as far as mix issues, like if, if one instrument's just too loud or a voice isn't loud enough or this or that or the other, those kind of mixed ratio things, or the mixed texture or the, or, or the sound or the tone of something, you know, that, that is not something that you want to try to address in mastering. Because although we can kind of dig in and kind of address that to a certain point, it is a Band-Aid approach. And our suggestion is always, okay, if we've got something that's broke here, instead of putting a Band-Aid over it, let's go back to the process back to where it's broke and fix it there. That way it comes in and it's truly fixed and not just covered up. So in short, a good mastering well, job starts with a good mix. <laughs> a strong- Mastering's actually, yeah. Mastering is only going to be as good as that mix. Because again, it's like, just talk about what well ago, it's all a team effort. So, you know, if, if I got a bunch of, got a bunch of spokes I got to put in this wheel and some of them are just not what they need to be. That wheel's just not going to be what it needs to be at the end of the day when we put it all together. It's going to not hold up too well. And music's kind of that way as well. It's got everything, all, all the dominoes lined up there right. It'll, it'll, it'll work well. We have so many questions coming through here. Uh, is it okay if I yeah, go I'll ask? let you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, there's questions that are popping up and I can't even catch up. Okay. Um, so one question. Hey, Larry, what outboard equipment do you have in-house? Okay. Well, the ones that are kind of a default that we use a lot are uh, the analog gear. It's... Uh, EQ wise is a millennia, we use a millennia NSEQ2 that has been customized. It's got several mastering mods from the manufacturer. It's got custom tubes in it that we use almost all the time. Uh, that EQ is a, is a dual topology EQ. In other words, it, it has a transistor circuit in it and it has a tube circuit in it. So we can go, we can select and go either way. And there's some noticeable difference between the two. Uh, uh, dynamic pro and all these are usually just very lightly touching the program. Uh, so we have that EQ. We also have a uh, Crane Song Ibis EQ that's a little more surgical if we need that. If we need uh, some additional color or something like that, that thing can be really good uh, to use there. Uh, we also use the Crane Song uh, STC8. Uh, compressor, which is just a program, again, pro two-channel program compressor that has uh, several uh, mastering mods been applied to it. Uh, the mastering mods that Dave Hill does, uh, also uh, the Bobcats uh, modification to the attack side of it and things like that that, that uh, just make it a val very valuable, very powerful piece. And I might mention that in dynamic control and stuff, these compressors, especially that, that one is used, we use them to shape the dynamics and not to squash anything. But one thing you realize through really good mastering, uh, music mastering is there's nothing sounding squashed. If anything, it's the other way around. It's coming out more open and more dynamic and more slamming because we haven't reduced the dynamic range. Uh, we've only done some shaping to it. Because our, our 
or DB reduction, those of you out there that know what reduction, dynamic reduction is, it's, you know, it's, it's measured by the DB. So we average around one, one and a half DB reduction through that. And this thing's capable of doing as much as 12 DB, let's say undetected. So, you know, it's, it's, it's because of the nature, the way we use it in there in mastering is different than the way you would use it in mixing. Mixing, you would use a lot more severe setting. Same thing with EQ. But those are the analog pieces that we'd use I know I got off on rabbit trail there. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't help myself. I just get going. And little, little, little. Well, here's another Flapping, question. Slapping at the jaw. Okay, go, go for it. Um, I think you might have answered this, but what should a musician expect to, provi uh, to be provided when hiring a mastering engineer? Well, first thing we do, like I said, we, we do a review. We want to make sure that you are indeed ready for mastering. If there's mix issues with that file, or that file needs a little, needs to be rerun at a little bit different uh, levels or, or whatnot. Uh, anything that's a mix issue, we want to bring that to light and, and go back up a step. Let's go back to the mix engineer and let's fix what needs to be fixed where it's, where the problem is and not again not mastering um so you know what was the question again come on i'm, I'm going off on the rabbit trail already <laughs> so the question was oh i just lost the question just in one moment oh. what is the musician expecting so if we sent okay. you a full prod okay so, go ahead. so we're going to do we're going to review then we're going to we're going to uh give you a price for the project project pricing uh a typical thing would be, I mean, because we get just a lot of singles in, and then we get albums in as well. But a lot of the singles, you know, we'll, we'll price it. We'll 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 issue an invoice once the invoice is taken care of in advance. Then we put it on the schedule for mastering, which is the first available, whatever that is, next day or the two or three days later, depending on what the workload workload is at the time. Um, then. On delivery, what we'll do is deliver, again, the high-res files, whatever those were from your mix engineer, uh, if 48K, 24-bit, 20, for instance, and then there'll be a 44-1, 16-bit set of weight files, and then a 320KB MP3 file. Okay, so you get three sets of files back on that song or that album or whatever. That's what, and then we'll also... Uh, encode your ISRC uh, metadata and uh, the, of course the foot uh, along with the other metadata is the title of the song and usually the artist. That's the main three things that go into metadata on our end. Okay. And that's what they get back. Now in the process there is one uh, one edit or, or revisit if need be to that file is kind of included in that original price. So it's not just, okay, we pay for it, it gets mastered, it comes back and there's something not quite what I thought it needed to be. You know, there, you, you, you do have one edit session or one revisit built into that. So that's in, that's, that's in a nutshell what you get as far as mastering goes. Okay, so what should one look for when looking for a mastering engineer? What are some qualities of a good mastering engineer? Uh, probably one that's not too full of himself. <laughs> <laughs> now you try to find one of those. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I think you need to look for one that's, that's got some experience. I mean, obviously, the more experience, the more years you got doing this, because you're constantly learning. I mean, there's no end to these. No, you don't just sit down and you know take a course or buy a few plugins or, or a few pieces of equipment and now you're a mastering engineer. It doesn't work that way. And uh, I, most things in this music industry don't work that way. You get better the more you do it. It's like that 
law of reciprocity. You know, it's like building muscle. It's that the more you use it, the more you do it, the stronger and better it's going to get. So look for experience. Uh, a lot of people on our website, the most visited page on the website is the discography. And that's where people spend all their time. I mean, we, you know, we, we can see the analytics from the SEO people about what, how the traffic goes. We even had, had that, they showed us one time our SEO did come back with this analyzation that they did showing where all the mouse went as people were visiting the page. And it's crazy to see that. But that anyway, that's what they, they do. So look, look for discography, look what they have done. Now, one thing I'll mention is that mastering isn't, at least in my opinion, and most people I know that do it, do it well, it's not very genre driven. It's pretty genre insensitive in a sense because we are just enhancing what's already there. We're not going to change the mix. We're only going to enhance the mix. So the ratios and the tonal qualities and everything that's in this thing, it's going to be the same when you get it back. It's just going to connect better and sound cleaner and deeper and more, more reality to it. So you want an engineer that's got, got uh, that a enough miles under his belt, if you will, that, that they can get that for you. Uh, that's what I'd say, look for. Awesome. Now there are schools where many engineers learn the craft. Are there any mm -hmm. similar programs for aspiring mastering engineers? I think there are, there's programs out there for mastering engineers. I've had interns from these schools. Uh, <clears throat> And, and not knocking the schools because schools teach them a lot of really great things, but it's different when you get out in the real world and you really, the best way to learn this is to go get an internship with a mastering engineer. Okay. Pay your dues there. I mean, yeah, you got, it's typically usually uh, an internship is usually a trade off. You're going to do some kind of work in that studio for the, for, for the privilege of setting in with this mastering engineer in sessions and watch them work and then be able to maybe eventually start bring in your little pet. And that's the way I do it. Let them bring in some little pet, pet project of theirs and let them begin to work on it, you know, and, and in the downtime, let them begin to learn how to do it. That's, that has been very successful. I've trained up several mastering engineers that way. Uh, the ones that come in that were already trained usually had to go through a season of untraining. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. It's just it's just not quite textbook. Now, the only real textbook I tell you that I that I found that's really great for mix engineers and mastering engineers is is Bob Katz. Yep. Uh, mastering audio that book that's a gold mine uh, and I highly recommend that 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 helped me so much and it still is a book that I have that occasionally I'll go back as a reference use it as a reference if I'm wanting to go back and check on something that I don't normally do you know room calibrations or something like that he's he's really got a lot of really nice neat approaches and theories about that that work really well. Awesome. I'm going to remind ask me another question. I'm going to ask you another question, but I'm just <laughs> going to remind the audience. Thank you so much again for joining us. We are just talking with Larry Anthony about mastering and we have got some really rich information here if you've missed the first uh, little while uh, 45 minutes we will be rebroadcasting this on our youtube channel gmi hub tv so definitely go back and look at it there but stick with us for this last few moments as we ask larry a few more questions from you Ooh. and by the way this is not a private conversation so go ahead and share the experience yes. okay so um do you feel, Larry, <laughs> that it is best to work with an established mastering engineer while learning the craft? I think you've answered that yeah. question. Yeah, you've answered that. Yeah. yeah, and do you find that listening to music critically outside of your mastering environment 
is also very helpful. Uh, yes, helpful. And I tell you what, you'll find yourself doing that uh, unintentionally. You, you just will. I, I do it all the time. And sometimes I, you know, I wish I could just listen to music and enjoy it. And, and I do. It's not that I don't. It's just you find yourself, even in the midst of that, something will pop out. So why is that? Why did they do that? Why is it, you know, I think that could be better. You know, there's always that. And mixed engineers are the same way. Musicians are the same way. That, you know, they're never satisfied with their own playing or their own vocal or whatever. You know, it's just, it's just it. It's just uh, critical listening is very, it's part of your skill set, your gift set, if you will. You've got to, it's just part of who you are. You're going to list, crit, listen crit, from a critical aspect for the sake of making it better, not to tear it down, but to build it up, right? Okay, so someone's looking for a story from you, Larry. What oh. is, oh. <laughs> oh, come Sorry. on, here we go. <laughs> So, Larry, what is the mastering engineer's worst nightmare? And tell the story. <laughs> Without names. Unless yeah. you are. Yeah. <laughs> worst nightmare. There's a lot of good stories, I guess. <laughs> you know, the, the endless project is probably the biggest nightmare. Project that never ends. That keeps coming. It's like everybody funny it just keeps going and going and going there's no end to it and uh <clears throat> even though i mean and i've had a number of those over the years and it's the same song you a lot of times over and over and over and they still they have to pay a resubmission fee and they know that they keep going down the same thing or if they're tweaking mixes and making mix changes after it's been mastered i've had some ma major record label and artist not too long ago they come in with this lady's album the producer did and the engineers and it had uh 17 18 songs on it now which is a big album and, and but it's but they still do it i just i'm doing one right now it's 20 songs wow but uh <clears throat> That we ended up, they booked three days because it was a again, it was a major record label and, and a major artist, well known artist. And we had three days booked to come in and do that for them to come in and do mastering, which is reasonable, should have been, should have been fine. Ended up being three weeks and 161 songs mastered. Wow. And the record label, when they got my bill, went through the roof. Not as bad as they did the, with the mix engineer's bill, because he was charging them remix fees on every one of them as well. So his was like, my, my bill was dwarfed compared to what his was. But yeah, and then it took us like, I don't know about him, it took me six months to get paid, because they were just dragging their feet about not wanting to pay it was too much and I agree, I agree with him it's too much but hey <laughs> you know I did the work <laughs> you gotta pay for it yeah. <laughs> so that's it was a nightmare for a long I mean that thing turned into a nightmare uh, anyway that's that's one that's one good story right there <laughs> be decisive don't be indecisive that was a problem here is the producer was just indecisive always changing his mind after the fact so I'll ask this because you're talking, still talking about mixing to the, the mastering. Um, and I think we touched a little bit on things that the mix that you would say to the mix engineer. Do you have uh, mm -hmm. a sheet that you send them or anything? I do. Like that? I, yeah, I have a, just a document, it's just a text document that I send out that's uh, criteria for mixes that are being submitted for mastering. And and it just outlines the dynamic ranges, the hid room, uh, the RMS averages, the LUFSs, you need to, the target area. And make it real clear, these are just generalized guidelines because every song is different 
and every one of them's going to fall in a little bit different place. So we just want to, we, what we, the reason we do that, we want to make sure that the music, again, the delicate parts, and the low level detail, the low volume detail is well preserved in these files. Because uh, if you get them too hot and they start hitting zero or the transients, the little fast acting pieces of energy that your meters in your normal mixing dolls do not see, when they start hitting that zero, they start depositing noises and clicks and, and garbledy gook down in the low volume areas. It starts building up and just degrading. And you won't really notice it. So the idea is that let's have a little bit of safety margin here. You got with a 24 bit wave file, you got 141 dB dynamic range. Okay, you can afford to leave four or five dB at the top of this thing, believe me, and preserve your music. And then we'll take it to the normal level. And we don't, our mastered files are, are minus one dB anyway. We never, we never go to zero because it's just not a good place for music to live. It doesn't live. It gets, it gets, uh, it gets killed up there. <laughs> Just stay away from it. <laughs> Is it possible for uh, us to get a copy of that so that if the viewers email us, we can send that to? Oh, absolutely. Viewers? Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. No problem. Exactly. So for, send it to you. so for I, all I'm the viewers send, who send are it watching, to your email, right? Yep. Yeah. So for all the viewers who are watching, just email us and what's the email that. address, Cheryl? Email info at gospelmusicindustryhub.com and we'll be happy to send that out to you. Yep. Um, and I know in a previous conversation we had with you, you were talking uh, about mix engineers slamming a limiter or is it compressor on their mix bus? Mm -hmm. And you had some opinions on that before they well, sent that to you. Yeah, the kind of long same guidelines that we're talking about right here. Mix engineers will do that because again, they they get they get uh, they they get complaints from their clients uh, about it not being loud enough. So they'll strap an L two or whatever across their mix bus and send it to their client for approval for mix approval. Right, but that that file is not the one that you send to mastering. I get those a lot of times from artists that are producers because that's what the mix engineer sent them as a final mix. But we want the mix engineer to send us the mixes intended for mastering is what we call it, and they're going to have a little bit of different dynamic uh, handling to them. Again they'll adhere to that document that we were just talking about. So you, <clears throat> the best, most really great mix engineers won't, they won't put anything on that mix bus. That mix bus, that fader is at, at unity gain. I mean, nailed at zero, it doesn't move. And there's nothing on that bus. Because when you hit that bus, you are now not mixing, you are mastering. You're outside the mix. Mixing handle happens in front of that. Once you cross that, that finish line, that is no longer mixing. You are in a mastering realm and you're doing pseudo mastering by, by strapping anything across there. Uh, so really, you, end, you, you end up mixing to that thing as well, instead of doing a mix that's not being adulterated by a plug-in on, on the mix bus. So really they shouldn't be sending the two mix to their clients to get it okayed with with uh, the limiter on their their t on their bus. Yeah, it, it would be best if they could get by with that. I mean, and tell hard. them that it's going to be bumped up in, the, in the master. Yeah, they don't. You know, for some reason, there's a paranoia. <laughs> Whoa, there's a, there's a paranoia about actually turning a volume control. Up. <laughs> A speaker <laughs> volume, right? I don't know. It's like they're scared of that. Why don't you just turn your speaker up? You don't, don't, don't destroy your music trying to make it loud by turning the level up. Uh oh, it says my internet. Well, while we're waiting for Larry, I, I think the internet is is kind of going back and forth. But how about we, we we will say this? Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Larry, for sharing. If you come back, we'll let you finish your sentence. Um, we also want to get 
I'll give you a chance to to um, not to forget to join to visit our our YouTube channel GMI Hub online. I was corrected on that GMI Hub online in order to see this and other um, awesome episodes of GMI Hub online. And I also wanted to let you know something new or something that we've been talking about in the past off and on is actually going forward. And that is we are doing our Christmas compilation album. That is right. We are now, now, now accepting submission. So if you have an original song that is Christmas themed, because it is a Christmas album, and it is original based on lyrics and melody, and is less than four minutes in length, consider submitting it with us. If you have any, any questions about that and, and what you need to do for that, please go ahead and visit our website, gospelmusicindustryhub.com and you'll look for Christmas compilation page. You'll see all the details there. We look forward to hearing or seeing some songs from you. In the meantime, see you next week. And remember, Gospel Music Industry Hub encourages unity, community, mm -hmm. mentorship, and talent, talent growth. growth. We'll see you next time. Bye.